Friends, good morning. It's a delight to be with you in this form at the East Midlands Synod as you meet today. I bring you the greetings of the whole United Reformed Church and wish you well as you discern together what is your call to be the East Midlands Synod today. It is perhaps a brave Synod clerk who invites a new General Secretary to speak of their vision of the future of the United Reformed Church. It might be a braver still General Secretary that did just that. Because of course, we are a people who ultimately believe that we discern our vision and our future best together. Not at the whims of any one individual, be they clerk, moderator, elder, or as one fellowship group I knew well had as an officer, assistant tea server. So I want to speak not of my grand plan for the URC, for I don't have one. I want to speak of some of the realities that I believe God may be calling us to attend to, and I want to do so with the help of two pieces of scripture. The first is the remarkable letter that the prophet Jeremiah writes to the exiles in Babylon. Their world has fallen apart. Everything they thought they knew had been taken from them. They've lost their place in the world. Literally their place in the world, the ground that they called home. And they've lost their place in the world metaphorically their standing and status and all the things that gave them their identity have been cruelly taken from them by an enemy who has trashed their existence. The prophet Jeremiah is one of the awkward squad. He speaks hard words, words we often don't want to hear. What would we want to hear if we were in that situation? We might want to hear that it might not be too long, that things would get better, that God would reverse the fortunes of the people, those doing the enslaving and those enslaved having the tables turned. That might be what I'd want to hear. Instead, the people get. Only when Babylon's 70 years are complete will I visit you, and I will fulfil to you my promise and bring you back to this place. 70 years. I'll be long gone in 70 years. 70 years, a whole lifetime. I don't want to hear that lockdown will end in 70 years. I don't want to hear that in 70 years things might get back to how they were in 2019. If I were in exile, I would want to hear that even less. But never mind God upending things and smiting my enemy that I might be liberated from their oppression. God's words to the people through the prophet are a little different. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have daughters for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. In this moment when the people have lost their place in the world, what are they to do? Build, plant, grow families and relationships and seek the welfare of the communities that they live in. I want to suggest that we are in a form of exile. 
That's blindingly obvious in one way, as we gather in this somewhat disembodied form on Zoom, gazing at one another in little boxes on the screen, listening to words recorded in an office a few days ago, coming from communities in varied states of confused lockdown, many of us still in effect shut out from our place in the world where we worship. But we're in another form of exile too, one that we were in even in the Halakan days before Covid. We, the United Reformed Church, along with all the churches in this part of the world, have lost our place in the world. We don't quite know who we are anymore. The things we presumed were certainties seem no longer to be so. The pace of secularization takes our breath away as we chart the speed of decline and think back to how things used to be. Once roaring chapels are now the tiny faithful remnant. We feel that we are in exile. We are in exile. And we often don't want to think about it, admit it, recognise it, face it. We'd rather pretend that everything is okay, but it's not. Vital to the message God had for God's people through Jeremiah was that the people had to face reality head on. They faced a lifetime of this they were staring 70 long years of it in the face, pretending it was not happening, pretending it would go away, was not to be faithful to the call of God. They were where they were. They had to get used to that fact and get on with it. Friends, we are where we are. We need to face that fact and get on with it. And I wonder whether God's call to us might not be so dissimilar to those of the exiles in Babylon. What do we need to recognise that we have simply lost, for our lifetimes at least? What has God, for whatever reason, taken from us. Many congregations will, I fear, come to the painful recognition that their life and mission is over at the end of this season of Covid. That God is calling them now to face that reality squarely. And that's okay. That can be part of being faithful to the situation God has placed us in. We might want to be back where our place in the world was as it always used to be, but God hasn't put us there, then, but here, now. What else might we need to recognise we've lost and be willing to let go of to be faithful? I suspect there might be much of the apparatus of being a large denomination that we cling to, that perhaps we are being called to put down. We will mourn it. We will lament it. We may, with the psalmist, scream at God in anger for putting us where we find ourselves. But that is okay too. And once we've got our head around where we are, once we've accepted that, once we've realised that in our lifetimes things are not going back to the full Sunday schools, the vibrant whole community harvest festivals, the glory days of the single pastorates where one minister tended one flock, once we've faced that squarely and acknowledged that that place in the world has been taken from us, then I wonder whether the call of God through Jeremiah to life in exile might just prompt us to contemplate 
what we're called to do in the place where we do find ourselves. Build, plant, grow families and relationships and seek the welfare of the communities in which we find ourselves. This is the world we live in, this secularised one where nobody much is bothered by the church and what we get up to. This is the world God has called us to tend and serve because it's God's world, full of people made in the image of God, with whom God is in covenant relationship. And we are called as the very specific people of God, the body of Christ, to make known that God is God, that this is God's world, and to seek its welfare as our home. For what is good for this secularised, Covid-ridden world in which we find ourselves is good for us. So God seems to be saying. What might it be to build and plant in this moment? Well, there's been some extraordinary building and planting gone on. Church communities who've transformed their worshipping and serving lives online, got in commun into community organising to make sure that the vulnerable are fed. But beyond our Covid world, in our exile in the secularised world, what is it to build and plant? Where are the new things that we might begin that are the counterpart of the old things that we've lost and been called to give up? Where might we catch a vision of a new worshipping community that might be needed? Meeting in someone else's backyard, perhaps a school, a community centre? Where might there be the place for the new, fresh expression of church? Connecting with the places people gather and the activities they engage in, from knitting to gardening to reading to singing to whatever. Where are the express needs in your local communities where a seed may be planted? What might it be to grow and build up our family and our relationships? What can we do in this exile to build up the family of the church, strengthen our relationships with God, with one another? Might we engage with faith-filled life, the next step of the walking the way journey for the United Reformed Church? Part of the Stepwise programme, giving us space with others to explore our faith and our living and what it means to be disciples of Christ? Could we do that as an eldership or a house group or a small community chapel or a fellowship group? Can we feed ourselves with the gospel in this moment of life spent so much at home at the moment? Faith-filled living is working brilliantly on Zoom. Could that feed and build up your church family in the dark days of lockdown? I might not, as the new General Secretary, have a grand plan for us. Sorry about that. But I do think this call of God through Jeremiah to the exiles shapes many of the conversations we need to have if we are going to be faithful to God's call today. What are we called to put down? Recognise that is lost and is not coming back and let go of such that we live in the reality of the world God has called us to live in here and now. Those things will be buildings and congregations and structures and ways of doing things and possibly some of our endless committee meetings that we treasured so much too. And it may be modes of worshipping that perhaps we love that belong in another time and place. And it's also about what we build and plant here and now in the place we find ourselves this Covid-ridden, secularised world that God has called us to make home, to seek the welfare of. 
What are we called to begin, to initiate, to start, to risk, to venture, to dare for Christ's sake? But I said there were two passages of scripture I wanted us to take with us. You may be wondering what the other is. Well, it's John's account of the resurrection. Just listen to this little bit of it. When Mary had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've lain him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Mary does not recognise Jesus. Mary! One of the people perhaps closest to him, one who was doted on him, one who has followed him around, and this climax of God's ways with the world, her risen Lord stands before her, and she does not recognise him. It's extraordinary. And it really is extraordinary. Resurrection is anything but ordinary. Resurrection is anything but a simple returning to how things were before, a turning back of the clock. It's a whole-scale transformation of reality. Jesus is transformed in resurrection. The entire world is transformed such that Mary, even Mary, of all people, does not recognise the risen Christ. As the body of Christ, the church, that resurrection is ours too. We don't know when we will emerge from Covid. We don't quite know what will be left of us when we do. We don't know when the long, slow, depressing, demoralising, 3-4% to 4 decline that has beset us ever since the URC came into being will end. It may not be in our lifetime. God may be saying, another 70 years. Or actually, the moment may come when we least expect it. In ways we could never have anticipated, even in the middle of a Covid lockdown, perhaps. But when resurrection comes, don't think for one minute that it will leave us unchanged untransformed. Be wary of the fact that we may not at first even recognise it, because we may find ourselves face to face with a church that is both deeply familiar, rooted and grounded in a gospel ancient and unchanging, and yet so utterly transformed, at first we don't quite recognise it for what it is. The resurrected church, the resurrected body of Christ. If we're looking for the old thing, which even the Apostle Mary managed to do, we may not at first see the new thing staring us in the face. I remain convinced, and I know it is a hard message, and maybe one we don't want to hear, that like those exiles in Babylon, our place in the world or what we thought of as our place in the world, has gone. We don't live in a promised land. The halican days of the 1950s have been taken from us. We need to recognise that, wake up to that, lament that, set our face to that reality. But this is the world, and this is the place in which we've been set. This is the place in the world at the moment that we are called to build and plant. And we accept the loss of what has gone and put down the remnants of the old and look towards new possibilities, new potentials, 
the resources we do have, which are more than perhaps we might imagine. And we ask ourselves what it is to seek the good of the communities in which we find ourselves and to plant the seeds of the gospel that others too may live knowing that resurrection does come. And we build up our families of faith, procreate the gospel, deepen our relationships with God and with one another, such that we are attuned to God's word, attentive to the movement of the Spirit, live faith-filled lives that lead us to human flourishing. We will build and plant and water and build up our family of faith and seek the good of the communities we are in, and if we do that, we will find out exactly what vision God has in store for us. We await the resurrection of the church. We don't know when. We don't know how. But we do know it will be. It will be surprising. Shocking, even may even make us fearful. God turning up has that effect, you know. Amen.